that we are dealing with the problems of peak oil and uh, the end of cheap oil, that we are also uh, moving from an era where it was easy to get at oil and petroleum underground. And one of the stories that we can lift up and address at this point in time happens to be the story of the Canadian tar sands, which are located and developed in the province of Alberta in Canada. But the U.S. oil addiction that we were talking about, the question is, who's fueling that? Where is the fueling coming from? It's good old Canada. There we see the Athabasca and the Peace River and the Coal Lake those are the pieces where the arrow is over here pointing to the actual development in in that part of Alberta. So what we are dealing with in terms of the Canadian tar sands is the uh, largest, one of the largest hydrocarbon deposits ever discovered on this planet. We're dealing with a, with a deposit that has somewhere between 175 and 200 a billion barrels of proven oil reserves using conventional uh, uh, technologies that we presently have in place. January 2006 in Houston, there was a meeting between our two governments, Canada and the United States, plus the major oil companies, in which uh, a set of demands was put forward by Washington calling for a five-fold increase in the amount of oil coming from the tar sands to the United States. And the primary source is bitumen, which is a black uh, glue similar to asphalt found deep underground. If we look at up here, we see the, uh, the, uh, uh, the excavation that goes on and the huge kind of equipment that's used to do that, to produce this kind of bitumen. And there are two processes that are used. One is open pit mining. And the second is in situ uh, processes. And then the bitumen is then upgraded through major upgrader plants and then put in pipelines and sent by pipelines uh, throughout the, the United States. Three basic sources that are used, a great deal of natural gas, a great deal of water, and a lot of toxic chemicals in this process. Here we have... Uh, the forest, the boreal forest, the way they are in their natural state before the, uh, the actual process of tar sands production takes place. Over here we have, I know it's, it may not be all that clear, but there's a huge uh, piece of equipment there, uh, one of the excavating trucks, and you can probably see how big it is in relationship to the people themselves. When, when, you, when you move from there to there, this is the transformation process that takes place. The, the ripping apart of the, and the strip mining of the forest to produce a moonscape kind of reality over here. And then we look at the fact that 90,000 square miles are a part of that whole area of Alaska, of the Athabasca, the Cold Lake, and the Peace River. 90,000 square, 90, square miles. We call this turning gold into lead because a lot of natural gas, clean, a relatively clean fuel like natural gas, is being used to, as a part of the whole process itself. If, you look at, if we look at the, uh, the open pit mining, 750 cubic feet of natural gas is used to produce one barrel of crude oil. And then you add to that the in situ methods that are used 1,500 cubic feet of natural gas is used to produce one barrel of crude oil. Over here we see the pipelines that are being envisaged now to bring a natural gas from the Beaufort Sea and from, uh, from the Arctic down and or if necessary putting a spur on and linking into the Alaska pipeline to bring, that's, that's designed to bring natural gas down into the southern United States. Greenhouse gas emissions that are coming as a result of the tar sands are huge and, and immense. We are talking about uh, uh, generating uh, mass amounts of massive amounts of greenhouse gases three times the amount of greenhouse gases that are used for conventional oil production three times are used in the production of the tar sands. In the production of the tar sands now, uh, 27 million tons a year are produced uh, of greenhouse gases. 
by the year 2015 to the period to the year 2020, that amount will grow from 27 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions to 126 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. As a result, obviously, the tar sands have become the number one greenhouse gas emitter as far as Canada is concerned and contributing greatly to the problems that we are all discussing here more globally today. If we move next to the, to the water slide, we see the, the water depletion as well taking place at a very rapid rate. It takes between somewhere between 2 and 4.5 uh, barrels of uh, water to produce one barrel of oil. And, <clears throat> And in some cases, that goes as high as seven barrels of water. And uh, at the same time, we're having major problems in terms of the depletion and the lowering of the Athabasca River, the North Churchill River, and the whole Mackenzie Delta. The whole Mackenzie uh, Delta watershed itself is in serious trouble now, largely because of what's happening with the tar sands. And furthermore, toxic chemicals are spewing into into the the the, the watershed to the point where uh, ab indigenous peoples, native peoples downstream, are are faced with and are experiencing some serious problems with regards to their, uh, uh, to their health and uh, cancer rates are growing at a very rapid rate. That the two major players in Canada that have pioneered this whole tar sands development, Syncrude, which is an alliance of different companies, and, 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 uh, sorry, and, and Suncor, which is a, another major company, both of these companies have spearheaded and pioneered the tar sands development. But now the majors are moving in from the U.S. in, 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 in big time. So we have ExxonMobil, we have uh, ConocoPhillips, we have uh, Chevron Texaco, and uh, at the same time, two other global players that are moving in, uh, Shell Oil and uh, British Petroleum, are playing big roles now in tar sands production and distribution. We realize that Chicago and Denver at the present time are the two major ports of, en of, uh, of receiving the bitumen. Then it is upgraded further into uh, crude oil that can be used and moved to different markets in the states. So there are markets in the Midwest, there are markets in the, uh, uh, in, in the eastern part of the, uh, of the United States, and increasingly markets are going to be opening up in the western part, even those states that have declared themselves to be uh, on a path of uh, being carbon free with regards to the future. We're seeing some real problems emerging with regards to the conflict between those, these states and, and, and the whole development that is taking place. This is, of course, the uh, U.S. energy program, that is security program that's largely driving this. Dick Cheney's national energy uh, program calling for increasing dependence upon foreign oil imports. And then where we have a situation of the Canadian crude now becoming the, the number one uh, supplier with regards to this oil and number one supplier and fueling of the oil addiction process itself. And as I said before, with a five-fold increase, we're looking at potentially six million barrels a day coming from Canada to uh, the United States to continue to fuel this process. We have the North American Free Trade Agreement, the proportionality clause, which calls on us to keep exporting at an increasing rate. And secondly, we have the security and prosperity uh, uh, partnership uh, that was referred to briefly last night, and particularly the Resource Security Pact, which will lock in and guarantee an ongoing supply of these, uh, uh, of these resources. This is clearly a nightmare solution. Uh, the Canadian tar sands is, the, is not only a false solution, it's a nightmare scenario, and it's going to exacerbate the triple crisis in three ways. By consolidating the U.S. oil dependence and fossil fuel future, thereby denying the warnings of global peak oil. Secondly, by intensifying global warming trends uh, through ever-expanding greenhouse gas emissions, and high levels of net energy loss, and thirdly, depleting and, and destroying other vital natural resources such as water and the boreal forests. And finally, just want you to all know that uh, this is uh, not going away without a great deal of resistance. We are seeing major resistance now beginning to develop in the province of Alberta, spreading in different parts of Canada as well. And we're going to see this campaign begin to uh, grow and develop. 
And then thirdly, or secondly, we are, we are clearly seeing some cross-border collaboration and development of cross-border strategies of resistance, and more of that's going to happen in the future. And I want to say finally that we are not only in the situation of saying, we've got to bring an end to this, we've got to uh, roll back th this kind of uh, development, we've got to come up with a new model of development, and we're looking at in many cases what the Aboriginal peoples are outlining in the northern part of Canada and bringing that forward as a vision for the future. And we call it, along with borrowing a phrase from some other groups, changing the dream.